I'm Jim Perkins, General Manager, Chevrolet Motor Division. I know firsthand that Carvette ownership can be a very special experience. And to my mind, there's no better expression of Chevrolet's total commitment to quality and owner satisfaction than our 1990 Carvette. You know, we're real proud of it and of what the Carvette nameplate has come to represent. Outstanding engineering, careful craftsmanship, memorable performance, and what's simply a unique, one-of-a-kind driving experience. We've been pleased to have this opportunity to tell you more about the 1990 Corvette and to share with you this information on how and why it performs as it does. It's a great car, and we know you're going to enjoy it to its fullest. If there's ever a question about your car, we provided you with information on where you can turn for help. I can assure you that the entire Chevrolet organization and your dealer is standing behind you and your Corvette and the many miles of carefree driving that awaits you. We thank you for your business and for your support. Corvette the 1990. Today's testimony to a nearly 40-year-old tradition of automotive excellence and excitement from Chevrolet. This will be an in-depth look at this legend on wheels, rightfully called the world's best production sports car. Always exemplifying the most advanced concepts of automotive designers and engineers, always leaving an indelible and unforgettable mark with each of its totally unique faces, always providing its owners with a highly personal statement of achievement and attainment. With roots going back to 1953, Corvette has stood alone as a unique expression of Chevrolet power and performance. And since its beginning, Corvette has assimilated and perfected knowledge gained in the crucible of competition at Sebring, Pebble Beach, Watkins Glen, Daytona, at Le Mans, Elkhart Lake, Riverside, on road courses and ovals, Corvette has proved its mettle to the point it's now in a class by itself. Corvette against Corvette. In this program, we'll be taking a detailed look at the 1990 Corvette. Throughout the program, you'll see this time coding device in the corner of your screen. Using the index on the video cassette cover, you'll be able to fast forward to specific segments as you wish. In our program, you'll be hearing first-hand perspectives from the people responsible for the design and engineering of today's Corvette and from a performance driving expert who is also the principal organizer of the Corvette Challenge and from the proud owner of a 1990 ZR1. Really, I'm very proud and excited to be the owner of a new ZR1 1990 Corvette. It's, it's a winner. I know Chevrolet has helped me over the years and the things they've done, I can't thank them enough. The first time I pushed the throttle down on the Indy V8 engine, I knew we had a winner. And I know we've got a winner here with the ZR1. So welcome to the Corvette Club. Let's start where the eye starts, with Corvette's distinguishing overall design. That's the responsibility of Corvette chief designer, John Cafaro. Uh, the Corvette has to be the best possible uh, car, the best effort, the best engineering, the best design. Everything goes into that, that car. And uh, that's really what the owner's getting. He's getting the best that uh, we can do at GM and at Chevrolet. The heritage of the Corvette is very, very important. Uh, it's foremost in our minds. Uh, the fellows that we have working on the Corvette in our studio uh, have been working on Corvettes since the 60s. And uh, they're enthusiasts. They, they go to the swap meets. They know what the customers uh, are looking for. And, and you can see it. When you see a new Corvette, uh, if it doesn't have a name on it, you can still tell that it's a Corvette, the flowing fenders and the uh, the lines of the car, the four taillights, are all Corvette traits. It's a very graceful uh, design. It's, it's not overly pretentious. It's, uh, it really is a thoroughbred. It's lean, uh, like an Olympic diver or like a thoroughbred racehorse. That's really how we approach it. It's, uh, it's a very integrated, uh, functional design. The clamshell hood design for, is a very, very uh, dominant feature on the car. And what that does is uh, 
makes the car easier to work on, but also exposes really all the, uh, the new technology that's in the car, the aluminum uh, wishbones, the, uh, the engine is uh, very, very exposed, and uh, to the enthusiast, I think that's very important. The ZR1, because of its, its nature, it's just a more aggressive car. It has uh, more aggressive tires on it to, to handle the power. And uh, basically what we did was try and reflect that in the rear end uh, styling of the car. It's more muscular and it's uh, quite a bit wider. Uh, when you pull up on a ZR1, it has a lot of road presence and uh, you know it's something different. And uh, that's really what we, we did styling wise on the car. This is the Mossport Road Course near Toronto. It's home for the John Powell Motorsport Advanced Driving School. Let's hear why Corvette is the vehicle of choice for his precision driving school. One of the things I like about Corvette is the available performance from an integrated car. For a production car, it has outstanding braking capability. Massive rotors, twin piston gallopers, and they're all balanced with an anti-lock braking system, which is world class. The most important function of all when you balance that with the power and the handling is that you've got more in reserve. There's more performance in this car than I'll ever need unless I'm on the racetrack. I reckon my time is valuable and I can't stand it when a car's down. My Corvettes don't go down. I like that. It's a tough car. And the service is easy. But you know, these are very sophisticated cars electronically. They have a new GM tech line, computerized automotive maintenance system, and that's the key to the whole darn business. You can't leave it to guesswork. Throughout Corvette's long history, it's had only two chief engineers. First, the legendary Zora Arcus Duntov, who guided it through its initial development from an auto show idea car to a production vehicle. And on Duntov's retirement in 1975, Dave McClellan, who cut his Corvette teeth under Duntov's direction and has led the Corvette engineering team ever since. Let's spend a few minutes with this Corvette brain trust as they discuss their work on the 1990 model. Besides Dave McClellan, the team includes Jeff Yaknin, Corvette engineering business manager, Jerry Fenderson, chief body engineer for Corvette, Doug Robinson, Corvette Technical Manager, Jim Miniker, Corvette Powertrain Systems Manager, and Mike Andalora, Corvette Chief Electrical Engineer. They're joined by Rich Seppos, Executive Editor of Car and Driver Magazine. Every generation of Corvette uh, has been followed very closely by people like myself in the automobile uh, business, in, in the journalism business, and uh, it brings up the subject of the 1990 model and where things have evolved to right now. So Dave, I'd like to ask you, for this year, what was the engineering mission that you and your people set out to accomplish with the 1990 models? Well, the first thing, Rich, is we can't forget all this heritage either. You know, we're immersed in it every day and it's, it's part of our Corvette lifestyle, if you will. So what we do for the 90 car is really carrying on that rich tradition of what Corvettes have always been and uh, taking it one step forward. The 90 Corvette really represents uh, uh, another culmination of bringing together a whole bunch of exciting technologies and embedding them into a car that we're selling to our customers and, and we're really excited about that. Now I just drove the 90 Corvette and uh, you can't mistake the fact that when you get into it it's a completely different car. The interior is all new. Why don't you uh, Tell me a little bit more about what you had in mind when you uh, completely refurbished this thing. Uh, the strategy uh, behind the 1990 interior is to provide the customer with a softer looking interior, kind of cocoonish and womb-like. We also uh, plan to give the customer added occupant protection with the addition of the airbag system, which is standard uh, for the 1990 Corvette. Well, the whole interior is completely different in the sense that we've got all new door trim, center console, instrument panel. As Jerry said, we've gone to the, a womb-like interior, a jet cockpit fighter environment almost. Uh, all the gauges are now lit up for easy finding in the dark. And of course, there's a ZR1, which uh, all of us in the automotive journalism 
business have been drooling over trying to get as many miles behind the wheel as we could. Uh, we, we went to uh, France to uh, flog it at very high rates of speed and uh, enjoyed it thoroughly. So uh, what's the story with this one for this year? Well, of course, this is the introduction of the ZR1 for 1990. Uh, there isn't much uh, new that could be said that the motoring press have not already said. Uh, I think from a powertrain standpoint and, and the engineers that have worked on the package, the exciting part of it is that that has not been talked much about, and that is the fact that we have 300 foot-pounds of torque at 1,000 RPM. So the car behaves uh, remarkably well at low speed has a glass smooth idle and provides uh, all the uh, low speed uh, power and uh, simple drivability that you'd expect out of a passenger car and still maintains the uh, high speed capability of a race car. So we have a very wide dynamic range with the ZR1. Uh, you can't tell the difference between it and a normal Corvette when you're just idling around town. It's, uh, is that, that's what you're saying? That's correct. It's more than expected out of a car that is able to run with all of the exotic sports cars of the world. Yeah, I think that's a key thing we've found too, uh, that it's wonderful even when you're just tootling along looking at the uh, scenery, uh, just as wonderful when you put your foot into it and rev it up to, what's the uh, rev limit now, 7,000 RPM? Yes, we shut the fuel off at 7,000 RPM, so it has a very soft uh, uh, red line at 7,000. It's nothing that uh, is abrupt or, or jerky. Uh, power peak is at uh, 6,200 RPM, which allows you to all the excitement of a very high revving uh, engine. Uh, after you get above 4,000 RPM, it's a new world up there for Corvette enthusiasts. The instrument cluster and driver information center to its right are designed to let you know at a glance how the car is running. Let's start with the black and yellow instrument cluster, utilizing liquid crystal displays. At its center, the speedometer shows speed in either miles per hour or kilometers. Pushing in on the English metric button on the trip monitor panel to the right of the center instrument cluster determines which is displayed. The fuel gauge is part of the display in the center of the instrument panel, with a series of bars indicating how much fuel is in the tank. Directly below the speedometer is the odometer that indicates how far the car has been driven. By pushing the trip auto button on the trip monitor panel, you can select either the trip odometer or the regular odometer. The word trip appears to let you know when you've selected the trip reading. The trip monitor also includes controls for determining fuel economy, with readouts appearing in the center cluster. Pressing the Instant Average button lets you choose either Instant Fuel Economy or Average Fuel Economy. The reading shows up to the left of the fuel gauge. Press the Range button, and you'll see a readout on how far you can expect to go with the available fuel. The readout is displayed to the left of the fuel gauge. The Fuel Reset button should be pushed whenever fuel is added, so that the system is reset to provide accurate readings. The tachometer, indicating engine revolutions per minute, divided by 1,000, is located on the left side of the instrument cluster. In other words, if the tachometer reads 3, the engine is turning 3,000 revolutions per minute. To the left of the trip monitor panel are a series of four dials providing important operating information. The leftmost gauge alerts you to any problem with engine oil pressure. If pressure falls into the cross-hatched area while at idle and stays there, it means oil is not circulating through the engine properly. Next is the engine oil temperature gauge. If the oil temperature approaches the cross-hatched area and stays there for some time, it's too high and the engine oil level should be checked. Third is the engine coolant gauge. Again, a reading in the cross-hatched area could indicate a possible problem with the engine cooling system that requires immediate attention. If that ever happens, your new full-color Corvette owner's manual shows exactly what to do. The fourth dial is the voltmeter, which indicates the level of electrical voltage being produced. This should be in the middle of the gauge most of the time. Corvette instrumentation includes a number of warning lights to indicate possible problems with one of the car's functions. Clustered around the instrument panel are specific warnings for the brake system, 
doors ajar, oil and temperature gauges, and security system. If one of them stays on, check your owner's manual right away to see what to do. There's also a system's problems warning light to alert you to any problems with a number of Corvette systems that are constantly being monitored electronically. Okay, the, the, the 90 Corvette has ABS electronically controlled. It has uh, uh, all kinds of microcomputers throughout the car. Uh, I am wondering how a customer, how an owner knows whether these systems are all working, if any of them are not working up to par. Uh, it's a very complex automobile. Uh, how can you be assured the thing's uh, working right? Well, most of this is going on, Rich, out of the sight of the driver. He doesn't really need to know what's going on, but I'll just use one example to get us started. In the airbag system, the system is continuously self-checking itself by sending low voltage signals around through all its wiring, uh, through the sensors, through the airbag module itself, and it, it's keeping track all through the life of the system exactly how's it doing. So it's, it's asking, are you okay, questions of all the external circuits. And uh, if things aren't okay, it turns on a light that tells the driver to uh, go after servicing that system. But uh, what that really has accomplished for us is a system that uh, is smart. Uh, the ABS, though, there's a system you use every day. Well, not, not the actual ABS system, but the brakes. How do you know that if you need ABS, it's actually working? Well, every time you fire up the car and then put it in gear and drive away, the, when you go through about three miles an hour, you'll hear a, a noise behind you in the Corvette, and that's the ABS system cycling the pump that's part of that circuit. While it's cycling the pump, it's also going through a, a total self-check of the wheel sensors, of the electronic package, uh, and everything else associated with it. So whether you use the ABS system in your driving daily or not, it's checking itself and making sure that it's working right. And of course, if it isn't, it'll tell you about it. Well, it, you know, the, a the ABS really breaks the, uh, splits the brake system up into uh, three separate systems, each front wheel individually and the rear wheels together because of the positive traction and the differential. Uh, you, you really can't control each rear wheel separately because they're, they're sort of locked together. So it's like having three little brake pedals in the car and the computer controls. And it, it will try to give you steerability and, and, and uh, the best stopping distance under all conditions. Uh, the split mu condition is, is a, you know, one of the bad ones, but also a high speed braking in a turn, which you could get into with a sports car that's capable of fairly high uh, cornering uh, coefficients like uh, the Corvette is where it's about 1G. Let's move across the instrument panel now to the driver information center located above the heating and air conditioning controls. It provides important safety and maintenance facts including warning lights for low coolant level, inflatable restraint, battery charging system, anti-lock brake system, engine service, and low tire pressure warning system and selective ride control. I think the uh, most significant uh, single system on the, uh, the car is the selective ride system and it uh, gives us the, uh, the ability or capability of, of showcasing the ZR01 that has a, a, uh, an operating range of around town, it, lugging around at uh, 25 or 30 miles an hour to, to uh, chasing uh, anybody that you want on an Autobahn in Germany at 180 miles an hour and I've personally done that and it's quite thrilling. Uh, but the, uh, the computer controlled suspensions uh, like, like se Selective Ride are going to be commonplace on all cars in, in 10 years just like fuel injection is today. Uh, fuel injection replaced a carburetor and, uh, and electronically controlled shock damping is going to uh, replace shock absorbers. You just talked about Selective Ride. I've driven the car with uh, the FX3 package. Um, I think it's quite impressive what it is capable of. What benefits do you see for the owner? How, how should he use it and uh, uh, what good is it to him? Well, what, we try, what the FX3 uh, Selective Ride System does is uh, allows you to sort of dial in the ride that uh, suits your, your frame of mind. 
Uh, we, we have a switch on the console that's marked Touring, Sport, and Performance. And in the uh, Touring mode, uh, the shock absorbers are, are, uh, have their lowest uh, damping control and the, allows the car to ride fairly smoothly. Uh, 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 sort of a traditional floaty, almost floaty passenger car ride, but still enough wheel control to, uh, to be safe. Do I understand that each of these positions has within it six uh, variable ride settings that change with speed automatically. So in, in, in the softest position, when you have a nice boulevard ride, uh, as you go more and more quickly, it firms up to compensate for the speed, even in the, uh, uh, in the touring position. And then the, the sport and competition do the same thing. Six built-in changes, uh, steps, if you will. For 1990, all Corvettes are equipped with a driver's side supplemental inflatable restraint system or airbag and the emphasis is on supplemental. Seat belts still must be worn to ensure proper driver and passenger protection. The biggest um, new technology in the 90 car of course is the airbag system and that is invisible added protection to the customer. Of course, we do request and demand that the customer wears his belts at all time, but he does have added protection. Uh, the first thing the customer will notice about the 90 interior is the specific steering wheel. The, the wheel horn pad is uh, larger because it houses the module, the airbag module. There's a specific column with a coil that ties and interfaces the electrical in the column to the airbag module. You will also notice knee bolsters for added protection uh, for the femur. So the, the customer uh, will get invisible added protection in the 90 Corvette. This light on the driver information center should come on for about five seconds when the key is turned to run and then go out. That indicates the system is working. The supplemental inflatable restraint system and seat and shoulder belt provide driver protection in front end collisions. Crash sensors and an accelerometer measure the force of the collision. If it's hard enough, they send a signal to the system so that within a fraction of a second, the airbag is inflated to help restrain the driver. It then deflates in less time than it takes to blink your eye. The system has undergone testing in a variety of situations to ensure top-notch reliability. But again, it's a supplemental device and can't take the place of proper seat belt use. On the left side of the steering column is Corvette's smart switch that controls turn signals, lane change indicator, headlight high beams, windshield wipers and washers, and the cruise control system. Light controls are on the left side of the instrument panel. Turning the control knob one stop to the right turns on parking lights, side marker lights, tail lights, and the license plate light. Moving the control to the far right turns on the headlights. If the ignition key is removed while the headlights are left on, a warning chime will sound. Instrument panel lighting and interior lights are controlled automatically by a photo cell. They can be controlled further by a dimmer lever next to the light control knob. Moving the dimmer control to the full upward position turns on courtesy lights under the dash panel, on the doors, in the cargo area and near the spare tire. All Corvettes are equipped with fog lamps as standard equipment. They're controlled by a switch directly below the light control knob. Within your discipline, within the area that you worked on to develop in the new Corvette, what would you tell an owner is the most important facet of that? Without question, it's the one-two punch we have in our lineup of powertrains. In both cases, we give what the customer is looking for, and that is performance, uh, backed up by outstanding fuel economy, low speed drivability, and a glass smooth idle. Some of those items are the application of our, uh, HV, our engine cooling package, our engine control uh, package. Um, some of my group here would like to talk about that. One example is the uh, slanted back cooling system that we're using on both the ZR1 and the L98 engine. Uh, we found ourselves in a situation with the ZR1 where we did not have a cooling capacity, so we had to go back to the wind tunnel 
and develop a package that was suited for the shape of the car. In addition to uh, tipping the radiator as a part of the uh, cooling strategy, we've also released a solar windshield uh, on the ZR1 Corvette. And of course, the solar windshield will cut down on solar load. And the ZR1 customer uh, would get additional uh, comfort uh, in the summertime. What, what does this entail, this new windshield? What's, what's it made of or from that's different from the current car? Well, the solar windshield uh, is a coating that's applied uh, to the windshield, and its purpose is to reduce uh, solar load. I've driven uh, the Corvette six-speed manual and noticed sometimes there's a feels like a hidden hand is making me shift from first to fourth rather than uh, first to second in some condi conditions. Uh, what's that all about? Well, what you experience there is a computer-aided uh, gear selection. It's a feature that we introduced in 1989 with our standard L98 pushrod engine, and it carries uh, to the 1990 L98 and the ZR1 as well. Uh, what it does for you, it uh, uh, is consistent with our theme of expanded dynamic range. You have a car that uh, enjoys a, a very good uh, roadability, good top speed, and is good around town. Uh, it controls the uh, shift schedule of the uh, manual transmission cars with a computer. And it tells, the, uh, it tells the transmission via a solenoid that engages the main shift rail that the customer is driving uh, in a part throttle normal fashion and that uh, to optimize his fuel economy, we will select him fourth gear and help him uh, guide him actually in making his upshift from first to fourth gear instead of first to second. Well, that's not something you'd want to do in most cars, is it go from first to fourth? Well, in fact, that's why we have the computer control there and a little light that lights up and tells the customer, this is okay, there's nothing wrong with doing this, it won't hurt the car at all, and in fact, it optimizes your fuel economy. And that's the other end of the scale that we're trying to cover. We're trying to give the customers more than expected in terms of fuel economy on what has been deemed a very good uh, high-performance car. Uh, I notice in the ZR1 that there are uh, what look like two ignition keys, one where the regular ignition key goes and another one uh, in the face of the dash there. Uh, tell me some more about why you have that second key there. Well, that's the uh, third key for the ZR1, uh, ignition, door lock, and of course the, our power key. Uh, the purpose of the power key is to provide the driver, the owner, a full control of uh, all of the horsepower available uh, to the ZR1. There may be instances where you don't want to give uh, somebody who's going to drive your car 370 horsepower. You'd rather him have 210 horsepower, which is more normal for a passenger car. Uh, what I'd like to do is tell you a little bit about how that works. It really controls the induction system. It controls a second set of butterflies and the second set of injectors in the induction system. So when you turn the key to normal, you get uh, eight injectors instead of 16 and no butterfly control. What it doesn't give you is any difference in uh, performance or fuel economy up to about 4,000 RPM. So there's really no difference for around the town kind of driving. The L98 handles terrifically already. Why does the ZR1 need even larger tires than that? Well, when we started to, uh, to think about uh, designing a Corvette that would have about 400 horsepower, we asked ourselves, what are all the things you need to do to the car to, uh, to make it uh, as good as it can possibly be and take advantage of more horsepower? The, the uh, L98 for 1990 with 250 horsepower is pretty well optimized from the standpoint of all the chassis tuning and the, and the 275, 40, 17 inch ZR tires. But with 400 horsepower, uh, if you, uh, as you get on the, the accelerator coming out of a corner, you would break the tires loose and cause the car to, uh, to oversteer under power uh, with the 275s. It really needs more rubber on the ground. So we uh, worked with Goodyear and had them design the what has turned out to be the 315 35 uh, aspect tire, which was their Goodyear's first uh, production of a 35 series tire, uh, and it was actually designed to be a rear tire. It's optimized for forward thrust uh, uh, 
in you know driving torque uh, as a, in a compromise so that if you would try to steer it on the front it wouldn't handle as well as as if it had been designed to be a steered tire so it gives us this tremendous uh, traction and acceleration uh, potential to take advantage of uh, a car that was uh, you know designed with the thought of having 400 horsepower no matter how busy you are under hood checks in any car are very important you're fortunate with a corvette under the hood is a work of art underneath the engine control module here the heart of the electronic engine management system are a number of visual things you need to look at on the manual shift car is the translucent reservoir for clutch fluid you can check that visually, along with the battery, which has a little eye. If it's green, it's okay. If it's black, then the car probably won't start. Other things that are visual include the brake master cylinder reservoirs. Some things under the hood of a Corvette cannot be checked just by looking. You have to remove the dipstick on the power steering fluid reservoir to check the level. And you should do that when the engine is cold. Coolant level is checked in the catch bottle in the front fascia. And again, it's a dipstick checked when cold. The header tank is up here, and you don't want to open that when the engine is hot, because it is under pressure. Engine oil. Check that when the engine is cold. Remember that oil is the lifeblood of the engine. Now, in an automatic transmission car, you check the transmission fluid when the engine is idling, the engine is hot with the parking brake firmly applied. Finally, in the underhood checks, for those days when it rains, make sure that your windshield washer bottle is full. And in a Corvette, it's a nice, healthy capacity, so it'll take at least a gallon of fluid. Electric outside mirrors are standard and are operated by a control in the driver's door. Simply select the left or right side setting and move the knob up, down, to the left or right. Corvette's standard power windows have controls in each door, with a master control on the driver's door. The ignition key must be in the run position to operate the windows. Power door lock switches are also located on each door. Moving either switch to the rear locks both doors and is the only way to activate the alarm system. The system can only be disarmed with the door key. For more information on the pass key or the anti-theft system, consult your owner's manual. Corvette's optional power seats are operated by left and right side controls located on the center console. The control is a representation of the Corvette seat, with settings matching that part of the seat which they control. The front portion of the control moves the front of the seat up or down. The rear portion moves the seat back up or down, and the center portion moves the entire seat up or down. The optional electronic heating and air conditioning system includes several new features for 1990. The uh, heating, ventilation system, air conditioner is uh, all revised or all new this year. Uh, what, what's the story there? Well, in effect, the, uh, the thing the customer will see is uh, new HVAC control heads, uh, both for the C60 and the C68. But behind the scenes is uh, additional software controls. Uh, it's microprocessor controlled. Uh, we've got additional sensors, a solar sensor, uh, relocated uh, aspirators uh, for picking up ambient temperatures and so on. So a refinement what, of control. What's a solar system. sensor? The solar sensor is the sensor that you'll see on the top of the instrument panel that's uh, actually picking up uh, the amount of solar radiation picked up by the vehicle so that uh, we can compensate and do different control schemes uh, to compensate for sun load. Oh, so the car knows whether it's a sunny day or it's not a sunny that's day. That's correct. Really? Besides knowing temperatures, it knows sun. And what does it do if it's a sunny day? As In opposed? effect, you'll get different compensations, higher compensations, higher fan speeds, etc., to try to compensate for the fact that you're increasing solar load. A sensor reads the outside temperature that is continuously displayed. This can help alert the driver to changes that could affect road conditions. Another sensor on the top of the instrument panel measures the amount of heat the sun is adding to the car's interior and should not be covered or obstructed. To choose the temperature you want inside the car, push the up or down arrows appropriately. 
the system has a range from 60 degrees for maximum cooling to 90 degrees Fahrenheit for maximum heating. The display shows the temperature selected and then reverts to the outside temperature. In the off position, air will flow through the car only if it's moving. The system will attempt to maintain selected temperature but may not be able to do so. Pressing this button puts the system in the mode that will cool the interior the quickest. Air from inside the car is cooled and recirculated. The system won't work in this mode when outside temperature is below 40 degrees Fahrenheit. In the bi-level mode, outside air is cooled to the selected temperature, with air coming out at two levels, from the air outlets on the instrument panel and at the heater outlets near the driver's and passenger's feet. Warmer temperature settings will deflect more air to the heater outlets. When cooling of the outside air isn't required, use the vent button. It leaves the air as it is or heats it according to the temperature setting. Pressing the vent button brings outside air into the car with the air passing through the instrument panel outlets. In the heat mode, air is heated to the selected temperature, with most of it coming out the heater outlets near the driver's and passenger's feet. The rest is directed toward the windshield and side windows. Air won't be heated until the engine is warm. Pressing this button defrosts the windshield. Most of the air comes out through vents near the windshield to melt exterior frost or ice. Pressing the heat and defrost buttons at the same time splits the airflow between the heater and defrost to remove moisture from the inside of the windshield. The speed of the system's blower is usually controlled automatically, with the light above the middle button indicating the fan is in the automatic mode. When auto is pressed or a fan speed is selected, the display will show the fan speed and then return to the outside temperature display. When in the auto mode, the button can be pressed to check the selected fan speed. Pressing the auto button automatically keeps air at the selected temperature setting, with the system controlling selection of the best mode and fan speed. The rear defogger and heated outside rearview mirrors are controlled by this button. It works only when the engine is running. Pressing the button warms both the rear window and the outside mirrors for 10 minutes. If additional heating is required, just turn it on again. For 1990, Corvette buyers can select one of the most advanced automotive sound systems available. The Delco Bose Gold Series with compact disc and cassette player combination unit. A bunch of changes to the sound system I see for 90. What's going on there? And I think we've designed a radio with performance to match the car. You know, a 200 watt sound system, uh, six speakers, uh, CD plus tape, which is uh, going to be rather unique, I think, in the automotive industry. We've given our customers uh, something that no one else has. So it's a complete radio upgrade with a uh, much deeper, richer sound, a much more natural sound, I think, than you're going to experience in the 89 system. And I think it's just part of the evolution of the car. It's just another improvement, another refinement to, uh, to an already fantastic radio system. Another unique feature of the system is its speed compensated volume control. As speed increases, the system automatically adjusts the volume level upward. Uh, speed compensated volume, in effect, is designed to raise the radio volume based on your vehicle speed to compensate for uh, the, the road noises that you normally associate with driving. Uh, in effect, what you do is you set the volume where you like to hear it at any speed. And in a, the radio will compensate uh, based on changes in vehicle speed to try to maintain that same level. All radio controls are multifunctional. For example, the upper knob turns the system on and off, controls the volume, and tells the time when the ignition is off and the knob is pushed. When the radio is on, pushing this knob identifies station frequency. And when a cassette is playing, pushing it accesses the reverse side of the tape. The middle knob controls tone. Turning it to the left adds more bass, and to the right, more treble. The lower knob adjusts sound between the front and rear speakers. Turning it to the left 
increases sound in the front speakers. To the right, adds sound in the rear speakers. On the tune button, up and down arrows indicate directions for AM or FM station tuning. For rapid tuning, first press and hold the button for the direction you wish to tune, and then press the other side of the button at the same time. The auto button causes the radio to seek up or down for stations. Press the auto button and the green indicator above it will light. Now, by pressing the up or down mode of the tune button, it will go to the next station. Push buttons allow for pre-setting of 12 stations, 6 AM and 6 FM. Consult your printed owner's manual for directions on station setting. Also, consult your owner's manual for specifics on cassette and compact disc operations. Corvette coupe models come with a removable roof panel to give owners an open air feel when appropriate. Here's how it works. Side windows should be fully lowered and the ignition key in the lock position. To begin, move both sun visors to the side to uncover the front bolts that secure the removable top. Using the ratchet wrench stored in the center console compartment, loosen the two front attaching bolts. They'll stay in place once they're loosened. Now, move outside the car and, using the ratchet wrench, loosen the two rear attaching bolts on the roof. Now, open the rear hatch lid and locate the two storage brackets on each side of the rear area, below the courtesy lights. This is where the roof panel will be stored. Standing at the side of the car, lift up the front of the roof panel. Then, move the panel forward as you lift it off the car. Place the roof panel in the rear hatch, slide the rear corners into the storage brackets, and push the panel forward. Now, lower the front of the roof panel to the latch pin, and pull the latch release toward you, pressing down on the roof panel. Push the latch release forward, and ensure it's locked. To reinstall the roof panel, the process basically is reversed. Slide the latch release toward you and lift the front of the roof panel. Pull the roof panel out of the storage brackets and lift it out of the rear hatch. Go to the side of the car and lower the panel onto the car, placing rear guides onto their locating holes. Lower the front of the roof panel and position the front guide pins. Using the ratchet wrench, partially tighten the two rear attaching bolts and start to tighten the front bolts making sure the bolts are properly threaded into the roof panel. Then, fully tighten the rear and front attaching bolts. The wheel wrench to be used in the tire changing procedure is carried on the floor behind the driver's seat. The wheel lock key that's also required is stored inside the center console. There's a light underneath the carrier that's controlled by the instrument panel dimmer switch. If it's needed, Turn the dimmer switch to the full upward position. The spare tire and jack are stored in a carrier tray under the rear end of the car. Use the wheel wrench to lower the tire carrier tray. First, using the socket end of the wrench to turn the latch bolt. Put the hooked end of the wheel wrench into the tray slot and lift it up. Pull the latch bolt toward you to free the rear of the carrier tray. After the latch bolt is free, Lower the tire carrier tray using the wheel wrench. Now, pull out the spare tire from the carrier. Detailed instructions for changing a flat tire are included in the printed owner's manual. To store a flat tire, the spare tire carrier first must be adjusted since road tires are larger than the compact spare. To do this, First, push the tire carrier tray toward the front of the car. This causes it to drop into the lower position. Then slide the flat road tire onto the tire carrier tray, making sure it's correctly positioned and all the way forward on the tray. Use the wheel wrench to raise the tire carrier tray. Put the hooked end of the wrench into the slot on the tray. Lift the latch bolt and tilt it toward the front of the car, and then drop it down to the lower position. 
Now, secure the tray with the latch bolt, using the socket end of the wrench to turn the bolt until it's snug. To store the jack, first place it inside its storage bag. Then, remove the tray from the storage compartment behind the passenger seat and place the jack in the compartment. Finally, be sure to return the wheel wrench and the wheel lock key to their proper storage areas. Because of its size, the rear tire from a ZR1 can't be stored on the tire carrier tray and needs to be stored and restrained in the luggage area until it's repaired or replaced. First, remove the plastic tray from the storage compartment behind the passenger seat and place the jack in its storage bag in the compartment. Using the storage bag provided to prevent soiling, place the tire flat on the floor of the rear cargo area. Use the luggage straps to hold the tire storage bag in place, attaching each end of the longer strap to the rear cargo area hooks. Attach the remaining strap to the hook behind the console. Tighten the straps by pulling on the loose ends until the ZR1 road tire is secured. Be sure to return the wheel wrench and the wheel lock key to their proper storage areas. Careful attention to interior and exterior appearance can help ensure Corvette's beauty will retain its showroom luster. For interior care, your Chevrolet dealer has two GM cleaners, a solvent type spot lifter, and a foam-type powdered cleaner that will clean normal spots and stains very well. Glass should be cleaned often. Using GM glass cleaner or a liquid household glass cleaner to remove tobacco smoke and dust films. The Corvette's transparent removable roof panel is made of acrylic plastic with a special hard coat to resist abrasion. It should be cleaned with GM glass cleaner. Your Corvette should be washed often, avoiding strong soap or chemical detergents. Commercial car washes using hard silicone carbide cleaning brushes should be avoided as they can remove the aluminum wheel's protective coating. Abrasive type air cleaning brushes found in some automatic car washes can also damage the aluminum wheels and conveyor systems may not have enough clearance and can damage the car's undercarriage. We've talked a lot about subsystems of the car. We've talked a lot about details. And for me, it's putting it all together. It's making the vehicle more than the sum of its parts that really counts. And that's what I sense we've, we've really started to accomplish in the Corvette. It is a car that just works all together. And you really sense that out on the road. The car is just working. It's a symphony underneath you. It's, it's really great. I hope that Zara is proud of uh, his siblings. Corvette for 1990. Today's embodiment of what's become a nearly timeless statement of automotive excellence. Precision. Control. Performance. Power as it's needed. The unforgettable union of driver, machine, and the ever-beckoning road.